before I created the heavens and the earth, I was. When the earth and everything in it passes away, I will be. I hold the universe together from the smallest atom to the greatest galaxy. It all is in my hands. The sun is hidden in my shadow. Ignorance of the word of God is no excuse. The Bible was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and can be only understood with enlightenment from the Holy Spirit. With the understanding that the Bible was written with an Eastern mindset, much of what God intended man to know is lost in the Western culture. Now East invades West as Dr. Ed Bez, nationally known spirit-filled archaeologist, teaches the Bible from the mindset in which it was originally written. Watch now as the Word of God explodes with fresh new meaning that greatly increases a love for your Creator. Whoa. And now, here's Dr. Ed Bez. I want to spend just a little bit of time with you this morning in John's Gospel, Chapter 5. I suspect that I'll be spending this Sunday and perhaps another on this particular text. John chapter 5. <clears throat> this is the story in the Bible of the healing of or at the pool of Bethesda. And it actually covers all the way through verse 17. Are you aware that this particular miracle, I'm sure that you are aware that at the end of this particular miracle at verse uh, 16, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the reason that Jesus was a Sabbath breaker, he was violating the religious sensitivities and sensibilities of the Jewish community by healing a man who for 38 years has been ill. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Just to let you know the end result of this great miracle the end result on the recipient was healing. The end result on the vessel through whom the healing came was they sought all the more to kill him. Beginning in verse 1, I want to just read a few verses along here if you don't mind. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Can you say that with me? A feast of the Jews. Well, obviously, we need to stop here just for a moment to kind of figure out. As you know, John is the one gospel writer that seems to indicate that the public ministry of Jesus lasted for a period of three years because he records that Jesus attends three separate Passovers. But each time that he attends in the annual festival of Passover or Pasha, he specifically states now, at, or the writer specifically states, that Jesus went up to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. It is very obvious that whatever festival Jesus is now attending in Jerusalem is not the Passover. In the Gospel of John and elsewhere, any time that Jesus attended one of the three required festivals, which would have been Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, that is always noted. It's always mentioned specifically. But Jesus attended other Jewish festivals as well. So we need to take a look uh, for a moment at chapter 5 and verse 1 where it says that Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. 
What particular feast is it that he is going up to celebrate? And does that celebration, and that Jesus is going to attend it, is there a connection between his desire to participate in a religious festival have anything to do with the miracles or ministry during that festival time? And in this case, it actually does matter. If you look at commentaries, because you sometimes do need some commentary assistance and help in figuring this out, there is almost unanimous consent as to what particular festival Jesus is attending. He's going up to celebrate a festival that is one of the two uh, youngest of all of the Jewish festivals. Jesus celebrated two of the youngest as well as participated in the three oldest of festivals. Two festivals that Jesus participated in, and it might surprise you, Jesus actually attended Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're told specifically he went to the Feast of Dedication, and that is Hanukkah. But he also attended and celebrated another festival, which turns out in modern Judaism to be one of the most festive of all of Jewish celebrations. And it's actually rooted in a historical event that is not terribly dissimilar with, to the condition and uh, situation surrounding the man at the Pool of Bethesda. That particular festival is called Purim. Can you say that with me? Purim. P-U-R-I-M. The festival of Purim. Purim is a late additional uh, festival that celebrates uh, all cell phones off please okay unless you are a cop <laughs> unless you are God Almighty <laughs> yes thank you so much the Feast of Purim have you heard of the Feast of Purim yes it's actually rooted in a very hideous story in the book of Esther. Mm -hmm. Esther chapter 3 verses 5 through 10 is a summation of an attempt by Haman, an Agagite, to actually eliminate and destroy and erase and blot out forever all Jews throughout the entire Persian Empire. And it all started over a petty jealousy between Haman and Mordecai, who is related to Hadassah, better known as Esther. Whether he is cousin or uncle, whatever the relationship was, Mordecai somehow ticked off Haman. And Haman got petty jealousy working. He, he couldn't get it under control. And he becomes a raging lunatic, and he wants to eliminate Mordecai, but then he goes beyond, and that's how jealousy works. You become so enraged, you not only want to hurt the person that originally instigated your jealousy, but that rage just has kind of, uh, I guess you would call it the blast zone or the shrapnel that would fly off of his attack. And he hated Mordecai. And I think you know the story. He desired to build a gallows in order to see Mordecai hanged publicly. And he wanted to make a public example and to humiliate him as much as possible. So he constructed a gallows that the Bible describes actually is 70 feet in the air. 70 feet in the air, the gallows would be, so whatever body hung from it would be a public uh, spectacle throughout the entire Persepolis, where this particular story takes place. But we all know how that come out. How does jealousy work for you? How are you finding it to work for you? Does jealousy work for you? How's it, how's it working? How about rage and envy and war? What about revenge? How's that working for you? 
It didn't work well for Haman in the final analysis, the very contraption that he wanted to execute Mordecai became his own execution chamber. And he ends up being hung on his own gallows. There was such a tremendous deliverance that came because somehow Haman, through intrigue, political intrigue and chicanery and trickery, actually got the king of Persia to sign a death warrant, an extermination war, uh, warrant, kind of the final solution, if you will, to eliminate all Jews throughout the entire Persian Empire, and the, talk, and the clock was ticking. And just moments before this empire-wide extermination final solution document went into effect, the news is spread throughout the realm that Haman himself is hanging from his own gallows. Mm. It was such a tremendous, miraculous intervention and kind of, I guess you call reversal of fortunes for the Jews and a reversal of misfortune for Haman that the Jews from that very moment have celebrated this wondrous change in fortune when God intervened and did away with this uh, diabolical plot and plan to annihilate their entire race. Purim is celebrated on the 14th and 15th of March in every year. And it begins to be celebrated as the stars begin to appear. And every single Jewish home during Purim, that worked. You can see I'm not a smoker. I, I would have my little flick, my own bick working. <laughs> Every head of house, particularly around Jerusalem because they were close by at hand. It could have been as many as 20,000 households in the days of Jesus. They would light a candle and hold the candle high because it was a symbol of the joy of deliverance as God overthrew the plot of Haman in the time of Esther. But at a particular moment, when the night was the darkest, an announcement, a moment of announcement was made. It is now time to go up to the temple. And in mass, gigantic procession, all of Israel would march in concert with their candles held aloft by the head of the family. And they would go to the temple or the nearest synagogue. It was a spectacular sight. Seeing against the dark night all of these candles. And along the way, short prayers were being offered. When they arrived and congregated at the temple, the entire book of Esther is then read aloud. But what makes Purim so fascinating is that whenever the priest who was assigned to read the story of Esther, every single time the name Haman was read out loud, the congregation would cry out in unison the following, May his name be blotted out forever. May his deeds never again be called to mind. Every single time, candles aloft and dripping. <laughs> and da 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 da. And Haman said, and when the name Haman was pronounced, they cried out, May his name be blotted out forever, and never may his deeds be called to mind. And to this very day, there is a Jewish prayer that is uttered at Purim, that ushers in Purim, and that is its translation. May his name be blotted out and none of his deeds ever be brought to mind. This particular feast that we read of in John 5 
was not obligatory to Jesus Christ. He did not, as a good Jew, have to participate, but he chose to participate. And I suspect that he chose to participate in this festival, and I want to suggest to you, it may have been one of his favorite festivals, due to the very nature of what the people cried out. May his name be blotted out and none of the deeds of the enemy ever brought to mind again. I think there was something so spiritually stimulating about that statement that the great enemy that wanted to annihilate and eradicate God's people and thus try to thwart God's great redemptive plan through the Jews, there was something in Jesus that when he heard it, yes. it just stirred up the divine juices inside of him and he loved to repeat it with the people. May his name be blotted out and may his deeds never be brought to mind. Because I think Jesus was contemplating the great mission and why he had been sent here in the first place. Yes. That he realized there was a price to pay, but he also knew that there was this hideous, diabolical, satanic plot. And sin entered into the human race, and it was devastating family after family, life after life. And he knew that the time would come where he would be the very one who would allow you and I to also say, may his name be blotted out and may none of the deeds of the enemy, may none of his plots and plans, may none of his desires to annihilate our lives, to ruin and to destroy and to rob and to steal and to crush and to bruise and to wound, may they never be brought to mind. I think Jesus really enjoyed going up to Purim. I believe it was an intense desire in the heart of Jesus to attend. It, the timing couldn't have been more perfect. The historical setting ironic. The mood would have been charged for him to come into Jerusalem. Jesus was about to use a national religious high holy day to again himself overthrow the diabolical plot against an infirm man who for 38 long years had been bound. Verses 2 through 5. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. Bethesda, near the Sheep Gate, a pool called Bethesda. That is very telling, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, it was near the Sheep Gate. And if you're familiar with the Bible, Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 1 says that the Sheep Gate was restored by the high priest and his clan. It was the one gate in the ancient restoration process in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah that the priests themselves got involved. And it was the preachers who had reconstructed that gate. It was supposed to be the gate through which the sacrificial lambs and the sheep for slaughter at the temple were brought and ushered in through that very gate. So the preachers are involved. The priests are the ones who rebuilt that entryway, that gateway. Second of all, the Pool of Bethesda was there primarily uh, as a place that they could actually flush out the blood from the slaughtering. The, there were so many sheep and so many turtle doves and so many other sacrificial animals that they couldn't possibly have slaughtered them only at the altar, but just beside the Pool of Bethesda. So the Pool of Bethesda historically, at certain festival times, ran red with blood. But what makes this a particularly interesting pool, archaeologically it has been excavated in the last 60 years it's been excavated. And we now know what, it's, what it means. Bethesda means house of mercy. House of mercy. Can you not see the irony and 
calling a place a house of mercy, when in fact it was the exact opposite, the irony of it all, to call this place a place of mercy, a place of hope. And then it also to be the gathering place of every infirm, diseased, all of those in Israel that could not find relief in any other way, those that were thought to be medically uh, impossible situations, they were essentially sent to Bethesda. A house of mercy. And it had been venerated. It was a place that was thought that the angel in past days came and stirred the waters. And it was venerated basically because there had been past movings. There had been past movings at that pool. And how many people to this very day think that their present circumstances can be ministered to by past movings? Movings cannot meet present needs. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again to you. Past movings yeah. cannot meet present needs. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. I don't care what label you put on the church. You can call it the church where Jesus heals everyone or the church where everyone is welcome. You can call it the house of mercy. But if all that is there are testimonies of what God used to do, or what he did in the past, and people are drawn thinking that because he had done it that way years ago, weeks ago, months ago, even yesterday's blessing, yesterday's stirring of the pool of Bethesda cannot touch you today. True. Yeah. Past stirrings cannot meet present needs. Yes, amen. Yeah. Oh, oh Lord, what a cruel pool this was called the house of mercy. How merciful is it to hold a carrot in front or an apple in front of a cruel beast? Because even when the waters were stirred, it wasn't the masses that were touched. It wasn't welcoming to all. Only the first person who got in. It didn't heal many. It didn't heal several. Only the first person in. So how could you call it a house of mercy. You think that's merciful to tell someone, hey, come here, you'll get your needs met. Come here, you're going to get blessed. Come here, God's moving. I'm here to tell you this morning, if we're going to invite people here and say that God is moving, we better have a fresh move happening because people will come in and go out the same way they came. You need a fresh story. I tell you, you don't even need a pool stirring. You need Jesus to pass by. Yes, amen. You need the incarnate Jesus to pass by. It's not good enough Jesus. to invite people here and say, yeah, come, I mean, you can't believe what happened last week. This was a place of rich history. The pool of Bethesda had a great heritage. But it certainly was no house of mercy because there were line upon line upon line of the sick, the blind, the lame, the crippled, the diseased waiting for a similar moving again. Their hopes were invested in the stories of past movings. No one was at the Bethesda pool telling them, you know, Jesus is coming. Jesus is about to pass by. No one made that announcement. What I'm trying to tell you is we, we really need, because I do feel something stirring here in this house. Yes, come on. Jesus. But it's not sustainable. Amen. It is not sustainable unless there is a present manifest reality of Jesus 
in this house. Amen. True. I don't want to hear about what he did yesterday. Right. And he did some wonderful things yesterday. I was sharing with my wife. We shared at, um, it's called, is it Good Shepherds? Our Savior's Lutheran Church. Our Savior's Lutheran Church. And for Lutherans, they could cry. I was so surprised. I was looking for those kind of Minnesota Lutherans to be really the frozen chosen. But before that service was over, they were weeping. Jesus. They were weeping. The pastors invited me back. He says, you've got to come back. I, we haven't felt this way. Yes. And it was over the story of Jehovah Nisi. It touched their lives. Oh yeah. It was unbelievable. I was surprised beyond anything I could have imagined. And I'm sharing this with my wife, and I'm getting this head of steam build up as I told her what Jesus had done, what, what God had done yesterday. He, and she turned to me and said this, thank God for a godly woman. Rachel turned to me and she said, Ed, I'm very proud of you. I love you with all of my being, but I want to tell you something. Don't get tricked into thinking because something glorious happened yesterday. That that isn't enough, that that is enough that when you walk into the church this morning, that somehow you drag the glory from yesterday and try to drag it in today because the people who are coming to you, for you to minister today are different than the Lutherans yesterday. They have unique and special needs in their lives. And God may have stirred the pool yesterday for the Lutherans, but this morning, they're not Lutherans. They're a different people. And I said, oh man, you are so right. You are so so right. That's what I was feeling, Dr. Hallelujah. Exactly. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, I felt you know that. what's so disturbing? You have a pool called the House of Mercy. You have a gate, an entryway, an access, an invitation that was actually built by the preachers. Yes. Yeah. And it wasn't working. <laughs> a sheep gate. And who's going through it? Yes. There's no one going through it to halt the lane. They're hanging out at the pool of Bethesda because they're told they could get mercy there. They can get delivered there. They can get healed there. They can be accepted there. They can be loved there. They can be forgiven there. They can be accepted there. But here is a man who for 38 years never once entered in through the, the gate that was built by the preachers. Mm. 38 years the waters would stir and cast rumors. Isn't it cruel that if there was only a single stirring and only a single healing, that that would leave hundreds, perhaps thousands, with dashed hopes yeah. yet again? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, to some extent, the reason that we don't invite people to come is because we really, deep inside, are not fully confident that if we invite those with needs, that they'll actually have those needs met and they'll be changed by a fresh touch of Jesus. And I have to confess that in the past I have been reluctant, not here, elsewhere, reluctant to invite people where I personally was worshiping because it was occasional that the Spirit of God would show up. Oh, Jesus. Occasional. Every now and then we got lucky and had a good service. Brothers and sisters, we cannot have lucky services. Come on. We can't just have an occasional service where God is, is feeling real and can be sensed by all. That has to be the very essence of why we're here. Oh, let there be a fresh presence of Jesus. We don't want another soul to walk out the door untouched, unministered to, not feeling loved and accepted. Jesus. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called House of Mercy which is surrounded by five covered colonies. Here a great number of disabled people used to gather. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not know it, 
just outside these doors, there's lots of places where people with great needs are gathering. There's a name for where they gather. They're called taverns. Mm -hmm. They're called bars. They're called pool halls. And I bet you could name any other number of assembling places where sad people who need a touch. And here's the sad news, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give you good news, but the sad news is many of those very people who now frequent and hang out hoping to get one kind word even in the tavern. Do you know, I've never been a tavern attender, to be honest, but I have friends that have told me they had more meaningful conversation yes. in a bar than they did in church. Mm -hmm. yeah. That they yes. felt more accepted yeah. by the people that were attending these places not called churches, not called synagogues, not called houses of God, but they actually felt more accepted, greater level of mercy and understanding. In fact, this is the last person I was sharing with at Stardust Ranch. said, why should I go to your church? I want you to tell me a reason why I ought to go to the church. And I rattled off a list of reasons why I felt they should come. To which they said, the last place I went promised the same thing. But in five minutes, because I did not fit in, walls of rejection went up, and I determined then I would never set foot again. He says, quite frankly, I get more out of hanging out with the dudes yeah. at the Stardust than I did at the Pool of Bethesda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lord help us. Jesus. Lord help us. You know, it's not just this episode. If it was just the singular episode of a house of mercy, this cruel pool. But Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 tells another sad and cruel religious story. It's a, it's a tremendous story, and it's a sad religious joke. A lame beggar one day sat at a, at a, in front of a gate. And this gate was the gate that ushered people into the temple. And there was a special name that was given to the gate. It was so ornately constructed. The architecture was unbelievable. Beautiful architecture. It was aesthetically pleasing. In fact, the name that gate was called, it should have been called the Eastern Gate. But in the days of Jesus, it was not called the Eastern Gate. It was called the Gate Beautiful. That's right. Wow. That's right. wow. Well, then tell me, how come the lame beggars are on the outside of that gate? If it's such a beautiful gate, if it's such a welcoming gate, if it's a place that leads into the presence of God in the temple, why are the lame the halt? Why are the poor begging there? Oh, they had beauty all right. They had sophistication, but there was no anointing. Yes, yes. You understand, it is the anointing that breaks yokes. Yes. Hallelujah. It is Jesus passing by that makes a difference. Right. It's not the name you put on your door. This is a house of mercy. This is called spirit and truth. That we better believe and we better be, be asking the Lord for His spirit and truth to actually be in the house. Yes, Father. Yes. Well, this is not an accusation. I am just impassioned to share with you this morning. Beauty, but no power. Mm. Sophistication, but no power. Everything just fine. You could take a white glove, run your finger across any place in that sanctuary, and you wouldn't have picked up a piece of dust. But just outside the sophisticated, gorgeous, beautiful piece of architecture. And they called the gate, Gate Beautiful. What's so beautiful about it? What's so beautiful about it? The house of mercy. What's so merciful about it? That pool was cruel because it promised only what God used to do. Yes. Not what He is doing and what He can do. Hallelujah. Jesus. 
I have more than I want to say, but I'm constrained. I think you're getting the point. What I am praying over this house is that we become so impassioned that God is truly present amongst us. Yes. Mm -hmm. That our testimonies are not just about what he used to do, mm -hmm. but what he is currently doing in your life. Mm -hmm. And so, on my way here today, I stopped and knocked on the door to ask yet another one to come. And I changed my approach. And the person said, well, I promised you I'd come, but I just haven't figured out what, what is so unique about what's going on over there. I says, well, maybe it isn't about what's going on over there. But how about me telling you that this morning I had a wonderful conversation with Jesus. And I am so in love with He, with Him, that my life is changing as I'm standing right in front of you. I feel like the best thing in the world for me to do is to wash your feet and to tell you that somebody really does love you. Jesus. That's not something that happened yesterday. That's not something down in that house. I am just telling you what Christ is doing in me this very precise moment. And I'm here to tell you that stunned that soul. Jesus. Yeah, how is he going to respond? You can always argue against the past because it's open to interpretation. But it is difficult. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by yes. the, in the Greek, present word of our testimony. Not testimony, present word. That's why I get so frustrated with English translations. It says we overcome him by a present testimony. And I overcame the objection of one soul today by giving a present testimony. Yeah. And when I came this morning, before I came in this morning into the service, I had a wonderful opportunity. There's someone that's in the service this morning. I've seen him on numerous occasions. We agree. He's always very gracious and kind. But I didn't know anything about him. And I sat down, and for the next 10 to 15 minutes, I had a wonderful conversation with someone that I did not know, but with whom I had been worshiping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you what happened. There's a change in the nature of our relationship. When you show personal interest and talk yes. about what God is currently doing in your life, yes. it changes the atmosphere and the environment. Yeah. It mm -hmm. Our relationship will never be the same. And we must do the same amongst one another. Hallelujah. I don't want this to be the pool of Bethesda. Or only occasionally a little dab will do you. I don't want a bro cream encounter here. A little dab will not do us. Amen. There are so many people that need dab. We're going to need tubs and tubes of bro cream. If that's the kind of God you believe in. We don't need an occasional good service here. That is what's so frustrating. Jesus. Isn't it frustrating? Ask the pastor what frustrates him. Ask him what gets his goat. Ask him what torques his corcula. <laughs> he will tell you this. And I haven't even asked him, but I bet I could ask him. And this would be his predictable response. Dr. Bez, there are times when I sense and feel that God is really amongst us. And there's other times where it seems as if it's just the same old, same old. But I'm here to tell you that we can pray this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. We need fresh bread in the house. We need Jesus to pass by. Not just what he used to do. Not how he used to be amongst us. Not how many people used to attend here. I don't care. What I'm dealing with now is just what Jesus is doing in our lives right this very moment. Father, this morning, Amen. I ask you to forgive me if I was impatient with your people. That was not my intent. I'm impatient with myself. And I ask you, Lord God, to cause this house to be so, so immersed and baptized that the environment in this house will be so electrifying that your presence can be felt just everywhere throughout the building from the moment that people drive 
on this parking lot and as they walk through these doors. Amen. May you already begin to be engaging them and changing their lives. Move, oh God, move, sweet spirit of the living God, move amongst us. We're not asking you for an occasional stirring. It won't work for us anymore. That's an old day. That's a past day. We need, we have present needs. Past movies won't work. Just won't cut. Lord, and begin. Send a revival, truly, Lord, a genuine revival. And I'm asking you to start it in me. I pray for that little brother there at Stardust Motel. Lord, I know he's struggling with cocaine. I know he's struggling with drugs. I know he's riddled with a battle with pornography. But I also know there was a time yes, Lord. that he sang in a praise band. And nothing but a present touch of Jesus is going to work for him. As is true with so many of our friends that we could talk about this morning. We all have the same situation. So as we begin boldly to invite people to this house, I'm asking you, Lord God, not to be a visitor, Jesus. but to inhabit this house. Yes, Yes. Yeah. Possess us. Yes. Possess us. And yes. use us, oh God. Jesus. In the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. I apologize for any harsh tone. It's I'm more harsh and disappointed with myself. And if we will forgive me. I'm not preaching at you, even though it sounds like that. I'm not preaching at you. Sometimes a preacher, if he was honest, he's really preaching to himself as David True. once had to do. Soul hoped out of the Lord. Yes. When there's no one else to encourage you, sometimes you just encourage yourself by preaching to others. Yes. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. And as we eat a meal together today, have a meaningful conversation. Not prattle. Not prattle. But a meaningful conversation. What matters in people's life is not just prattle over a cup of coffee, but real meaningful conversation and not a relationship. Wow. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Before me there was no God form, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there's no Savior. Beside me there's no God. Angels and heavenly beings worship me upon my throne, and I will not give my glory unto another. I will not share my creation. I am a jealous God, and a consuming fire. I am the commander of the heaven's armies, and before me kingdoms crumble and rulers kneel. I am your harbor in the tempest. I am safety for the tempted and tried. I have come to set the captives free, to strengthen the weak, to heal the lame, to cause the blind to see. I have come to give you life and breath to breathe. I have come that you might know me. I have come that you might know my limitless love and endless goodness, my measureless mercy and never-ending grace. My forgiveness knows no boundaries, and my acceptance sees no imperfections, nor color, nor race, nor wealth, nor poverty. In me you are made clean, and through me you are sanctified. I am indescribable, incomprehensible, irresistible, and invincible. The heavens cannot contain my glory, death cannot consume me, life cannot outlast me. All knees will bow before me, and at my name every tongue will confess. Every tongue will confess that I am the great I am. Every tongue will confess that I am the God of gods.
revoir.